Welcome, traveler, to Folk Recovery, Kaya Cater. And here is Kaya's story. My name is Kaya Cater. I am a banjo player, a guitar player, a singer, a songwriter, and a film composer. I am folk because I carry tradition and I innovate on tradition. Being a banjo player, I was raised learning traditional music, traditional tunes from the Appalachian Mountains. But I also grew up listening to a lot of, um, like a wide range of musics and I had tremendous admiration and respect for artists like Nina Simone and Lauren Hill and Buffy St. Marie, um, who are all women who are well-versed in traditional music of some kind or another and who have chosen to innovate on it. And those were the people and the artists, a few of many, who I always grew up admiring. And so playing traditional music and innovating on it has always been the path for me. I found folk through my family. I can't remember a time when I wasn't listening to folk music. Uh, my family would play records like Nitty Gritty Dirt Band and Rye Cooter and, gosh, um, Jody Mitchell, Taj Mahal, uh, Neil Young. And so those records really were just it was like I took them in through osmosis. There's not a time that I don't remember knowing these people and their voices. And, you know, for me, it it was just like, it was kind of the stream that I was born in. And it feels like it's kind of imprinted into my DNA almost. <laughs> and so... Yeah, it it feels incredibly natural and incredibly joyful. I also found folk through bands uh, that were a little closer to my age group and my interest at the time. I found folk through a group called the Carolina Chocolate Drops, who were an all-Black string band from Western North Carolina. And they were originally a trio. It was Dom Flemons, Rhiannon Giddens, and Justin Robinson. And in their early 20s, they formed a string band, kind of seeking to, you know, tour and play, tour and play through America showcasing the pride of Black Western North Carolinian string band traditions. And their mentor was Joe Thompson, who was a a fiddle player. And he uh, passed away a little while ago, but he was kind of their elder. And they sat at his feet and learned his stories and learned the songs and learned about themselves and um, the community that they had come from, and not only the Western North Carolinian banjo fiddle community, Black banjo fiddle community, but a larger community, a diasporic community of Black people whose ancestors were uh, the original makers of the banjo. Um, and a lot of this history at the time that the Carolina chocolate drops came into prominence, the history had been suppressed, forcibly suppressed. Um, and the banjo was associated with, 
uh, white mountain folk. Uh, it was associated with bluegrass. It was associated with uh, Republicans. It was associated with sometimes with racism. And um, when I saw the Carolina chocolate drops, I was about 14 or 15. And they had come to Canada to play a festival that my mother was running. Um, and as I said, I was born into folk music. So it wasn't uncommon for me to see a lot of live music and see a lot of shows and participate in the music community. But when I saw them, things really changed for me because they spoke about um, the Black banjo traditions and the Black diasporic tradition. And it was the first time that I ever heard that Black people had played this music and were in in a massive part um like the beating heart of this music and at the time I had been playing claw hammer banjo already and I was getting pretty good and uh, I was having this crisis of identity just struggling to figure out why like why do I keep playing this thing that represents such a violent um identity that occupies such a violent identity in uh, our consciousness. Um, and I think often instruments have emotional and societal and political um, relationships. And they, um, when we hear certain instruments or when we hear certain melodies, we are drawn it's a really powerful thing because we can be drawn back into memories. We can, you know, it can be a, a source of attraction or repulsion. I think there's just so much that music can do for us. Um, and also music can, can activate us. And so playing banjo music was very soothing to me and that I loved the melodies of it. But it was also very activating for me because I felt like a traitor or I felt like I had no business playing this music and that it wasn't for me. And so when I saw the Carolina Chocolate Drops, it all came into place and I just felt this relief wash over me that I wasn't odd or weird or, you know, traitorous or whatever the words are. Uh, for playing this music, I actually maybe had some deeper, more rooted connection to this that I couldn't even, I didn't even know how to express. And they had the language for that and they had the pride for that. And that gave me a lot of freedom because as I said, I studied tradition. I, I went to college in West Virginia to study the banjo and study ballad singing and and connect with people there and and have a larger community but my heart was always passionate about songwriting and and just using all these things and bringing them together and why can't they come together why can you only be a contemporary musician or a traditional musician why do we have to kind of fit into these categories and seeing the chocolate drops you know, like they played hit em up style with <laughs> the banjo and the bones and the fiddle, you know? And it was like, I was like, yeah, wait, why can't all these things flow together? Why can't we do whatever we want, you know? And, and why, why do we, um, I think is especially in traditional music, there's a, there's a lot of, there's a lot the, of, of racism that you have to grapple with and historically look, looking through records and, and um, seeing that like, you know, Tommy Gerald learned to tune from a black man, but he only credited that black man by his first name. So there's no way that you can access, you know, that you can find who that person was. Um, and so there is a lot of grief and a lot of sadness when you interact with traditional American string band music. But what I saw was like just so much joy and love and like creativity. And that that opened massive, massive doors for me in my own head. 
and after that I just I became a lot more creative and I started writing songs on the banjo and I started you know mixing things up and I really do credit them for for that I see folk recovery in Canada as us finding each other. I think that um, historically, uh, people of color who play many different uh, styles of folk music we've often been isolated from each other, uh, which means that to me, isolation means also means tokenization at festivals, being misprogrammed, uh, being sometimes just kind of being put into these boxes, like I was talking about the boxes of traditional or contemporary, um, being put into these boxes that we don't necessarily fit into or want to fit into. And so I see the recovery process. I mean, what that's meant for me to use the example of finding the chocolate drops is to say, wow, oh my God, like, I love you and I can laugh with you and I can like, like break bread with you and I can text you. And like, we, we have this um, symbiotic relationship where all of these things that we feel like we can express with each other. Um, and so that's what I felt, I think, starting at 14 is this slow process of finding other people who, um, who I deeply admire and whose musicianship I deeply admire and, and who are capable of holding space for me and I them. Uh, in in the entirety of who we are, right? Um, and that's what I love, and that's what I want to do more of, and and that's what I love about this project is there's there's gonna be like a record of us, and not only one of us, but a group of us. And folk music to me, I mean, it's not about the it's not about the money. Like, it's not about the money or we would be in pop music. Like, let's be real. We'd all be in L.A. Um, folk music is about the community and it's about community support. And, you know, it's not to say that everyone's going to be like best friends, but I think it's getting out of that place of scarcity internally. And it's in the, the like racism and sexism and um you know all of the isms have sort of forced on us and finding each other and being the people that we need to be for each other and that's what I'd love to see like I think that like folk recovery will have happened maybe not in this generation but in future generations where I'll go to a festival and I will see like all sorts of artists, BIPOC artists playing all sorts of different kinds of music and it won't be fetishized and it won't be tokenized. It'll just be like appreciated. That's my dream. <laughs> That's my folk dream. <laughs> my final share with you, Traveler, is that there's a lot for you at home where you are. Uh, and you can travel as much as you want, but know that no matter how alone you feel sometimes that there are people like you who like what you like um, and who want to be creative and who want to um, innovate. You know, I'm reminded of Buffy St. Marie, when she was asked by a journalist whether uh, she was in that crowd of, you know, Joni Mitchell and Bob Dylan and Joan Baez and Neil Young and, and uh, you know, um, Graham Nash, uh, 
she said no she said i wasn't i i didn't hang with them like they weren't interested in in what i was doing or what i had to say but she said that she kept going anyway because she's like i thought that what i was doing was interesting and thank god she did because my generation um like me and my friends love her and love who she is still and and what she has done and i got to see her in 2016 at a festival in ontario in ontario like right like that's what i'm saying at home and buffy did a solo show and it was still it was still one of it's seared into my memory as one of the most powerful things i've ever seen you know and that's not to say that her, i mean her band is exceptional um but the the power is coming from her and she played a song called cripple creek which was the first song i ever learned on the banjo when i was like 10 she played that on the mouth harp and sang it and you know it it just it it just blew my mind like i i know that version and i know her version of it but she took this like this song that was so associated with like white america and she just made it her own and yeah i don't know i just i i think that we're not we're not just doing it for each other and for ourselves but we're we're doing it for people who may not even exist yet and who may eventually themselves be looking um for elders or for people who made their own path and so that's why i think it's very very important for us to have records um to keep records of each other and um you know to have evidence that we we lived and we created and it's it's just that's the most important thing thank you traveler for joining us on this folk recovery oral history production created by guest storytellers with contributions from Gaytree Killings, ASL performer and advisor, Joni Narita, folk community advisor and sound producer, Karen Young, technical producer, Stephanie Williams, assistant producer, Alyssa Matthews, station manager at CJRU 1280 AM, Allison Skirm, special collections and liaison librarian at Toronto Metropolitan University Libraries, Heather Hewitt, folk recovery logo designer, as well as senior artwork specialist and yogi. And special thanks to our friends, family, and community supporters, and to our funder, the Ontario Arts Council. I am Kijo Buchanan, narrator and executive producer. Ashe.